Today we're going to carry on and complete, conclude the series, Jesus Rocks. We've been spending the last few weeks on this. And I've been asking this simple question, what would it look like to build your house on the rock, like Jesus talked about, or more specifically, to build your life on the rock? And then I took that word, R-O-C-K, and I used it as an acrostic, and I said, this is what it would look like. Jesus would R, restore your relationships. O, he would help you overcome every obstacle. And C, he would create a new character. And today we're going to talk about the fact that he will keep us kingdom minded. And there's probably some people who think, what does that mean to be kingdom minded? There's a lot of different ways that it's expressed in scripture. Paul in Romans 8 put it this way. He said to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And I mean, talk about a contrast between those two things. One brings death and one brings life. And the expression carnally minded, probably a bit archaic for most of us, right? But it just means, I think we all understand it, it means to be worldly or fleshly uh, minded, to have our mind on the things of this world. And in essence, here would it, here's what it is to be kingdom minded. Kingdom minded is to somehow extricate ourselves from the lust and the lures of the world, which there are many, and to begin to focus on his kingdom and to live for a purpose greater than ourselves. And that's what it means when I talk about being kingdom-minded. So we're gonna jump right into this. Uh, I would define, there's probably many, many more, but I would say if we're gonna live kingdom-minded, it needs to look like at least these three things. I'm gonna throw them up on screen. Uh, number one is we, we're seeking, number two is we're sharing, and number three, or sorry, uh, seeking, serving, sharing, in that order. And uh, we're gonna look right into the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you've been thinking I've been spending a lot of time in this Sermon on the Mount in some of my, my messages, it's on purpose. I've spent the last two years in the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's the most extraordinary discourse in human history. If you want to learn how to live your life, that's where you learn. I have a book coming out on this, you know that, called A Greater Perspective. And I have just been so enthralled with the wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount, I just can't drag myself away from it. So it keeps showing up in the sermons. And uh, we're in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to see this word seeking coming up. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, this is what he says. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O little, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Don't miss that word. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of heaven of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what he does is once again, like Paul did, he clearly does this clear demarcation between these two dispensations of those who were the Gentiles, which of course were the non-believers of his day, and they were seeking after the things of this world. And he says, don't be like those people. He says, they're just after the things of this world and they seek after those things. And he says, don't you know that, that God knows you need these things? And here's the deal that he will make with you. If you will be kingdom minded, if you will seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will add all these things to you. And so in case you weren't clear on what he was talking about, he actually has a parable about it that really spells it out. And you can find it in Luke chapter 12. And it's the story of the rich, wealthy uh, landowner. And he has many, many crops. And his, he has so much grain on hand that his barns can't even contain it. So he decides he's going to tear down his barns, build bigger barns. And this, this is the wording from it. And then Jesus says, And so he will say to his soul, O soul, who talks to themselves like that? This guy does. He says, oh soul, I have many goods laid up for many years, and what I will do is take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God says to him, you fool, do you not know that this day your soul is required of you? And what that is, is that's a picture of a person who is carnal or worldly minded. He's thinking about himself, he's thinking about his future, and he's thinking all about those, and he hasn't taken care of his soul because you never ever know when your number is going to get called. And for this man, it was that day. And I know what we do. I know we read this and we say, well, I don't wanna be that guy. I don't want to be that guy who's laying up so much treasure on earth that you know he forgets about his future and he forgets about eternal things. 
So I'm just going to, you know, fill up as little bit of, a little bit of treasures on Earth, just a little bit. And you know, I think we pay mental assent to this, but I don't think we've totally figured it out. I think, I think we, we kind of feel like deep down in our heart, we think, you know, I know, I know money can't buy you happiness, but a little money wouldn't hurt. Maybe a little happiness from that money. And we think, you know, maybe it doesn't work for other people, but I think, I actually think money would make me pretty happy. And I think this is kind of what goes on in our head, even though we won't want to admit it out loud. So here's a true life story, uh, another example of this. Jesus gave his version of it. We have all kinds of anecdotal stories in our culture. And here's one that some of you remember. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Christina Onassis, and she was the daughter of Aristotle Onassis. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world. He was the, the Greek shippy magnet. Uh, at the time, he had more money than just about anybody. And he had this beloved daughter. Here's a picture of, of Ariel. Uh, and you remember, he married Jackie Kennedy, and she became Jackie. And this was his daughter, uh, Christina, and uh, he gifted her, are you ready for this, $250 million. How many of you think you might be able to live on $250 million? You, you think you could? Some of you could. Some, some of you are saying no. By today's standards, who, what's $250 million? It's nothing. People have billions these days, right? And anyway, she got this kind of money, and yet she lived an absolutely miserable life, and she was dead by age 37. She died lonely, miserable, unhappy, unhealthy. And there was this book written about her life, and here it is, uh, this Life of Christina Onassis. And it was subtitled, are you ready for this? All the pain that money can buy. And this is what she said. She said, if anybody thinks that money can buy them happiness, need to look no further than our family. Now that's confusing for me, because when I grew up, my father always used to say to me, Happiness, what's happiness? That can't buy you money. And, and if you want to know why I'm so twisted, it was my dad's fault. He used to give me life lessons like that. <laughs> so, you know, you get confused. But, but here's, here's the point I'm making, is that we kind of think that, that, you know, intuitively we know that it won't make us happy, but we go so trapped up in it anyway. And when you look at the priorities of the rich, and that's why Jesus tells these stories, there's really something wrong with their priorities. So I have this great story I love to tell, and it's about this very wealthy businessman. He had, a, he had a butler named Jeeves. If your name is Jeeves, your parents called you Jeeves, you were pretty much destined to become a butler. There's not many job opportunities out there for anyone uh, with a name like Jeeves other than being a butler. So, so anyway, he went on this trip, he, the businessman was on this trip, and he got an email from his butler, and the butler said, the cat is dead. Well, when the businessman got back, he was mad at Jeeves. He said, what kind of message is that to, to, to send? It was so jarring. And so Jeeves said, what would you like me to have said? He said, you should have eased it out to me. You should have sent a message saying something to the effect of, the cat has got, got up on the roof and he can't get down. And then, then a little while later say, the cat has fallen from the roof and is badly injured. And then a little while later you say, sadly the cat has passed away. If you'd communicated it that way, it would have been that much easier for me to emotionally digest it. To which Jeeves said, I will remember that for next time, sir. Well, a week later, the businessman is on a trip again. He gets an email from his butler. Your mother is up on the roof and she can't get down. <laughs> I wonder how many of you remember that song from the Eurythmics, Sweet Dreams. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? Travel the world in the seven seas. Everybody is looking for something. Now, they, they sang it pretty creepy, though. Do you remember? Sweet dreams are made of this. How this creepy kind of feel to it. But, but that last line always stuck with me, and I, I, it still is stuck in my head. Everybody is looking for something. And it is true, Jesus talked about how the Gentiles are seeking after the things of this world, God's people are to be seeking after the kingdom, and when you think about it, everybody is looking for something. Everybody's on a journey in life, everybody is looking for something. If I was to ask you this question, and I'd say, what are you looking for? Every single one, if I went around the room, every single one of you would have an answer. Now, if I didn't tell you what the context was, you'd probably say, well, I'm looking for a new car, or I'm looking for a new piano, or I'm looking for a, a, you know, a new house, or I'm looking for a new boat, or I'm looking for a new this, or I'm looking for a new set of nunchucks on sale at Amazon. You know, everybody's got something they're looking for at any given time. 
And why is it that our mind shifts towards these things? Like, you know, if I said, what are you looking for? Very few of you would say, world peace, because you're not in the Miss America pageant, so you know that's not the answer. You'll give me an honest answer. What you're really looking for is a new, new car or whatever, right? And there's a reason why this is where our brains go, because we have been inundated with thousands and thousands upon ads uh, telling us that whatever we have in this world, it's insufficient, it's not enough, it's not good enough, or we don't have enough of it. Now I'm gonna show you the stats on this because it's startling. Uh, In 1970, they tell us that we were exposed to 500 ads a day. So that would be newspapers and billboards and and television and and, uh, magazines or wherever. Still seemed like a lot. But a few years ago, they did the research on this, and they found out that number has gone up to 5,000. 5,000 ads a day. There are 5.3 trillion display ads on the internet right now. That's a lot of ads, people. And they say that the average adult sees 2 million commercials a year on television. I don't even know if that's possible. And if that's accurate, I don't know. I'm just showing you the the slide here. But here's what we know. That number of 5,000 ads a day, it changed during the pandemic and it went from 5,000 ads a day to 10,000 ads a day. You know why? Because we're all at home, we were on, online, and all of a sudden we were inundated, and we were told moment after moment that whatever we had wasn't enough and it wasn't good enough. And I'm telling you, the pandemic taught me so many important things from these ads that, that, uh, that I probably should be sharing all, with, all of them with you. I can't share them all with you. I found out that lemonade is, is made with artificial flavors, but the dishwashing detergent we use is made with real lemons. That, that, that's what I found out. I found out by firsthand experience that you can get skip the dishes to deliver you dinner faster than you will ever get an ambulance. I, I found out that even though I can't afford beef, dog food is now made with real steak. And not only that, it has a new and improved flavor. Now, I want to know who is this person that's quantifying the fact that it's new and improved? How do we know that it tastes better than the last dog food? Who is it that's actually tasting this stuff? Are there people who taste? You know, Joe, this dog food was way better than the old dog food. This is wonderful. Well, that's because it has steak in it. That's why it's, it's so yummy. And the, and, the, and the world has completely gone nuts, in my opinion, and I don't think the pandemic helped. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you my assessment of the pandemic response. Are you ready for this? You can tell me whether you think I'm on track with this or not. So we had a pandemic. You all remember that. And they said, oh, this is what we have to do. We have to all stay home. So everybody stayed home. So then when we stayed home, we went, wait a minute. If we stay home, we can't work. If we don't work, we don't make any money. And our prime minister said, oh, don't worry about that. I'll send you money. And if you need money, I'll just send you money. In fact, I'll send you money whether you need it or not. And I know people who got more money during the pandemic than they ever had before in their life, and they had trouble finding places to spend it. And we thought, well, this is really nice. They're sending money to all of us, buckets and buckets of money. And do we have to pay this back? Oh, maybe, maybe not. We'll figure it out later. We'll sort it all out later. And we're just gonna send billions and billions of of, of dollars to you. And, And imagine my surprise, silly me. I thought when he said, I have lots of money, to give you, I thought he was giving us his own personal money. I I didn't know he was taking it out of the coffers. I didn't know it was our money. And then people like me started asking the question and saying, well, where are you going to get all this money? Do you have enough money to do this? Oh, yeah, we we have all the money in the world because we run the printing press and we can just keep cranking it out. How could we be out of money? We still have checks in the checkbook. We haven't run out of money. And so they racked up some $400 billion, the biggest deficit in human history in in Canada and probably will ever be, who knows. And uh, so we thought that was good. Well, why would I go to work if I can stay at home and they'll send me money? But then I got bored at home, but I'm spending a lot of time online and there's a lot of good stuff for sale online. Have you seen Amazon? The stuff is fantastic. You can get these, these nunchucks delivered right to your home and I looked as now the if you were a UPS driver you weren't staying at home you had to drive and that UPS truck came into my neighborhood every single day the people across the street got a parcel every single day from Amazon they were very busy during the pandemic because they had to get rid of all this money now there was a slight problem that happened because everybody uh, you know there was nobody working right because they couldn't go to work because they had to stay at home and and work oh I mean shop on uh, online which one is it 
it, I can't remember. And so then if there's nobody working, then there's nobody building this stuff, and there's nobody building this stuff, we're gonna have this problem called the supply chain. Have you heard about the supply chain problem? Of course we all have. They ran out of stuff because there was nobody at work uh, building this stuff. There was just us at home buying it and they ran out of stuff. And so what happens, I wanted a new boat and I wanted a new hot tub and I needed a sunroom in the back of my house but I can't get it because of the supply chain and because uh, the dollar got devalued because we were printing it on the press and everything got more expensive because we supply had run low. I could no longer afford anything and inflation has gone sky high and now I can't afford to eat and I can't even buy dog food because it contains real steak. <laughs> How close am I on what we just went through? The world. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's my twisted mind at work. I know I'm having a little fun here. But, but see, here's what people told us. They said, you know what? This is going to be good for everybody. It'll be the great reset. People are going to get their priorities straight. They're going to start being concerned with their family. They're going to be less materialistic. They're going to be less uh, commercialistic. And that's exactly the opposite of what happened. People were more materialistic in the last few years than they have ever been. And the consequences on the church have been devastating. When the pandemic was ended, half the North American churches, people didn't even bother to go back and volunteerism just absolutely dropped like a rock. Now, I want to contrast this with the pandemic response that happened in the developing world, because here's what's happened. They had no vaccine. They had no printing presses to crank out money uh, ad infinitum. They had no way to deal with everybody's little problems. So people had to work whether they felt it was safe to work or not because they had to feed the family. And there was a sense of desperation and a sense of, of concern and they began to look at their lives. And what happened, and most people don't know this, is the gospel in the, th in the developing world took off like it never has before. And we were part of it because remember we got all that swell money from our government that we had and you gave us a bunch of it for missions and last year we gave four hundred thousand dollars to the 1040 window and I get the reports that you don't get unfortunately back from all of these missionaries and mission organizations and they said there was more churches planted more people came to Christ more pastors released in the developing world than any time in human history and the third world is in a full-blown revival while we're still shopping online And see, what happened is such an interesting contrast, isn't it? Because uh, those people are seeking first the kingdom of God, and God's taking care of them, and we were so busy seeking after the things of this world. And so we're all seeking for something, but it doesn't matter where we are on the journey, even if we know Christ, we have got to position ourselves that we are going to be those that are going to be kingdom-minded. And there's a moment, oftentimes there's a moment for us where everything switches, where, where, where we have this epiphany of what we need to do with our life. I want to tell you one such story that I've always found very inspiring, and it's about a, a journalist by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge. How many of you recognize that name? It's a little bit old for many of you, but he, here's a picture of him. He was a BBC journalist uh, some years ago. He's now passed away, but his name was as famous in the United Kingdom as like a Walter Cronkite would be here, or maybe today like an Anderson Cooper, Tucker Carlson, or one of these famous journalists, and he was, he he was a household name. Everybody knew who he was. Now, he was reporting on the affairs of the world, and he was an agnostic. He didn't have much time for church, didn't have much time for Christ. But something happened in 1970. He saw and heard a story about a little Catholic nun from Albania that was busy in the streets of Calcutta, India. Anybody remember this woman's name? Yeah, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And he had to go find out what she was about, what made her tick. And so he took this journey, and he took his crew, and he, and he went to Calcutta, and he, he met Mother Teresa, and he was blown away. He couldn't believe that this woman had left her home in Europe and, and gone to India and was in the streets with the poorest of the poor, dressing like them, uh, even in the, the lowest caste outfit. That was what she wore. And, and, he, and after he saw what she was doing, he was interviewing her and trying to get in her mind. And he asked her this question. He said, how often do you do this? She said, what do you mean how often? I do this every day. This is what I do. He said, wow, like how many months have you been doing it? And she said, months. I've been here 18 years. I've been doing this for 18 years, not months. 
And then he said, well, don't you get tired? Don't you want to quit? Don't you want to leave? And she said, why would I ever want to quit? Because I'm doing what God wants me to do. And when you're in the will of God, you have this happiness that you can't contain. And he couldn't get those words out of his mind. He couldn't escape that. And he went back and he did this story and it was published and it was a wonderful story. But he was so intrigued by this, he had seen something he'd never witnessed before in his entire life. And within the year, Malcolm Muggeridge, the most famous newscaster in Britain, came to Christ. And he ended up becoming the most ardent defender of the faith, probably in the UK at the time. And so he had this complete 180 degree, this tr complete transformation of his life and his message. He wrote a bunch of books about Christ and about Christianity and about faith. And, and he was a, a voice that people trusted and respected and all kinds of people came to Christ as a re result of it. And then in 1983, it's sort of funny, in 1983, he took one more step and he converted from evangelical Christianity and became a Catholic. He converted to Catholicism, and, and, and people were kind of confused by that, but he was just so impressed with this little Catholic nun from Calcutta and her sacrifice and willing to sacrifice that he, that he loved that aspect of this religion. And then he decided that his big goal in life was to meet the Pope. And he had a friend, William F. Buckley, someone will remember that name, and they were doing a piece on the Sistine Chapel, and he said to his friend, he, he said, my, my, he says, I've met all the important people of our day, men and women. Let me tell you something, almost all of them have been a big bore. And he said, I'd really like to meet this Pope. And ended up, they, he had this encounter, here's the picture of it. He, this, was his, this was on his, his wish list. This is what he was looking for. It's what he was seeking for. And there's, uh, so there's uh, Malcolm Muggeridge, William F. Buckley, there's the actor David Niven, and they had this, encounter where they, where they met the Pope and, and uh, he had felt like he had really achieved this goal in, in his life. And what happens when we change our, our goals and our focus and what we start looking for and seeking after in life, when it becomes really important, it makes a difference to, to not only to us, but to those around us. So I have a little story to, to tell you about this. So when Pope Gregory was in the Vatican, there was a Jewish slum right outside the walls of the Vatican. He couldn't stand it. And he decided that he wanted them cleared out. And so they all knew that they were going to be cleared out. And the Jewish community, they, they, they spoke to Moshe. Moshe was their, their wisest man. And they said, Moshe, why don't you go and talk to the Pope and negotiate? And so they arranged this meeting. And they had a bit of a language barrier because the Pope only spoke Italian and, and Moshe only spoke Yiddish. And, so when they got there, they realized they had to kind of pantomime, use sort of a type of sign language. So the Pope started off, and, and he, he went like this, and he put up three fingers, and Moshe responded and put up one finger. And then the Pope went like this with his hand, and, and, and Moshe went like this with his hand. And then the Pope held up a golden chalice of wine, and then Moshe pulled an apple out of his bag and held the apple out. And then, and then the Popes went, this man is the most brilliant man I've ever met. I'm going to let them stay. They have a brilliant leader. And so Moshe left and the cardinals gathered around and said, we're not sure what happened. W what happened in that communication between the two of you? Well, he says, I, I started off by saying, God is three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Moshe responded and said, yes, but he is still only one God. And then, then I said, God is everywhere. And Moshe said, yes, but he is also right here. And then I held up the chalice and said, he died and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And Moshe held up the apple and said, for the sin of Adam and Eve. He's a brilliant man. So Moshe gets back into his community and they all gather around and say, what did you say to the Pope that got us this reprieve? He said, well, I'll tell you what happened. He says, first of all, you've got three days to get out of here. And I said, we're not leaving. No, not one. He says, I want you all out of here. He says, we're staying right here. And then he pulled out his lunch and I pulled out mine. <laughs> That is not a true story, so, so, so don't go tell people the story of Pope Gregory. So, so, the, so the first thing is this, is that we're all on a journey, we're all seeking, and so we want to seek first the kingdom of God. But the second part of this is you don't just stop there. 
We have to be serving Christ in order to be kingdom-minded, and it's a very much a part of it. And William Barclay once said this. He said, the two greatest days in your life are the day you were born and the day you discover why. And here's how I began this message. I said, every single one of us are called to a purpose greater than ourselves. That is your greater purpose. That is your destiny. If you can figure that out, you will figure life out. And we all have something way more important than what we see around us every single day. And here's an iconic story I think you all remember. And it was, when, uh, it was when Steve Jobs was in need of a CEO to help him with Apple computers. And he started recruiting John Skelly. John Skelly was the CEO of PepsiCo. And uh, he didn't want to come over. There was no reason for him to come over. It was a smaller company. He was going to get paid less money, et cetera. And this is how Steve Jobs won him over. You'll remember this with this one line. He said, John, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to spend it selling sugar water? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And he realized that that's what he wanted to do. And I think you could rightfully argue that he probably did change the world. I mean, the Apple computers, you probably have a bunch of, you probably have a, a, an iPhone in your pocket right now, which you wish you were on instead of listening to me, but that's another story. And, and so when you look at what happened, he presented to him a greater purpose, right? And so when we think about the disciples, what was it that caused them to leave their, their nets, leave their boats, leave their businesses, leave their families, and go and follow Jesus? And, and it's found in the statement. He said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Not that there's anything wrong with fishing for fish, but what he did was he presented to them a higher call and a higher purpose, and they looked at what they were doing, and they're going, this is valuable, but not as valuable. And so they switched, and they followed him. Anybody remember where Matthew, the tax collector, was when Jesus called him? Someone said, he was in the tax office, and Jesus said, come and follow me. He didn't say, and I'll make you fishers of men, but basically he says, you're fishing for taxes. Come and we'll fish for something much more important, people's souls. And he found Mary Magdalene. We're not sure where he found her exactly, but we know what she was fishing for. She was fishing for John's, right? And, and he goes and recruits her, another person whose life was transformed because she found a higher purpose. And the higher purpose really sometimes isn't higher at all. A lot of times what that higher purpose is, is it's actually serving our fellow human being. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be servant of all. So Jesus illustrates this. You'll remember the story. They're having dinner. They finish dinner. And then Jesus does something unusual, even for him. He takes off his outer garment, ties a towel around his waist, goes and gets a basin of water, and he kneels down at the feet of each one of his disciples, and he starts washing their feet. You all know this story. It's in John 13. Now, here's what was so extraordinary about that. That job of washing someone's feet in that day and age was the lowest of the low as far as a servant was concerned. People in those days didn't wear shoes. They, they didn't have, you know, they might be barefoot. They might be in sandals. They had cracked hard feet, and there's dirt and grime, and who knows what else, toe fungus, that gross toe fungus like you see on TV. Uh, who knows what they had on their feet? And these people had to wash the feet. And by today's standards, it'd probably be the guy who has to scrub the toilets. We don't want to do it. We respect him for doing it, but we don't want to do it, right? Jesus takes the lowest role in the society, and he starts, so he starts washing these guys' feet. Now, they don't know where to put this, because he's the master, they're the disciples, he's washing their feet, he gets to Peter, do you remember this part? Peter wigs out and says, you're not washing my feet. He says, Peter, I'm washing your feet. It's the way, I'm, I'm giving you an example here, I'm washing your feet. But Peter, you know, being Peter, says, well, then you can wash all of me. And he said, look, Peter, you can bathe on your own time. I'm washing your feet is all I'm doing. And then he tells them, he says, I'm doing this as an example for you. And I want you to go and do likewise. And there's a few things being, being you know, illustrated and communicated here. And the, here's the two that I would break down to. Number one, he was saying there should be no job ever beneath us. Jesus was the son of God. King of kings, Lord of lords, and he was washing people's feet. What was he saying? There's no job 
beneath me. I will go to the very lowest. And the second thing I think he communicated was this, that I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Would you agree with this? And this is the message that Jesus gave us. We're not that special. We're all just human beings. And if we're going to make a difference in this world, we're going to have to learn how to serve people and make a difference in our world and sometimes lower ourselves to a place that might seem somehow beneath us. And so, you know, that just really rung with me years ago when I first read this. I thought, you know, that's what I, I need to act like that. I need to lead like that. I can never ask anybody to do something I'm not willing to do myself. So 35 years ago, I've told you this story, when we started our church, we were on the corner of Grant and Nathaniel, and there was a little church building there that we rented, and the yard in front of it was all grass. There was far more grass than there was building. Now here's the question, who's gonna mow the grass? Now we had 50 people, we had no volunteers, we had no money to hire anybody to mow the grass, so just take a wild stab at it, just take a wild, wild stab at it. Who do you think mowed the grass? Yeah, you got it, buddy. That was me. I was mowing the grass. <laughs> and here's, here's what I used to do. And so on Saturday morning, I'd wake up, I'd mow my own grass, throw the lawnmower in the back of my white van that I drove for 30 years that became famous around here, drive down to the church, and then I would mow the grass. And it took me forever because it was this huge piece of land, and I'm going back and forth like a zombie with this lawnmower, and not being bitter, mind you, but, but, but mowing it. And one day, one of the guys in the, in the church drives by, and he sees me mowing the grass. And he can't believe it. And he rolls down the window, and I turn off the mower, and he said, Pastor Mark, what are you doing? I said, I'm mowing the grass. He says, yeah, I know, but why? I said, well, because it was getting too long. And he says, no, 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 why are you mowing the grass? I said, who else is going to mow it? I said, we don't have any, <laughs> we don't own a mower, we don't have a staff, we don't have anybody else, who else is going to mow it? He said, well, that's impressive that you're mowing it, and he drove away. <laughs> 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 And then about, t about 10 minutes later, he came back. God got a hold of him. And he came back, and he got out of the car, and he said, Pastor Mark, I would like to mow the grass. Can I do that for you? And you know that from that day on, he mowed the grass every week for the rest of the year. And you see, the, the message is simple. There's nothing beneath us, and anything that we want someone else to do, we have to be willing to do it ourselves. So one of my great stories about this is about this pastor. He's walking down the street one day, and there's this 12-year-old kid on the corner of his yard selling a lawnmower. And he says to the kid, why are you selling a lawnmower? He says, I'm going to take the money from the lawnmower, and I'm going to buy a bike. I need a bike. The pastor says, you know, I have a bike I don't use. I'll trade you the bike for the lawnmower. And so the kid says, you're on. We can do that. And then, then the pastor says, but the lawnmower has to work. Let's make sure the lawnmower runs. So he goes and he pulls the rope and he pulls the rope and he pulls the rope again and it doesn't start and he pulls the rope and he pulls the rope again and it doesn't start and he's pulling and pulling and he's sweating in his brow and, and he turns to the kid and he says the lawnmower doesn't start. And he says, well, you have to cuss at it in order to get it to start. And the pastor says, well, come on, I haven't cussed for so long, I don't think I'd remember how. To which the kid said, just keep pulling on that rope, it'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> So the, so the first thing is this, is that we are seeking. The second thing is that we are serving. And when we look at people in this church, I'm always amazed at the people who serve in this church. Uh, it's incredible to me that we have talented people, hugely educated people. We have professors and PhDs and we have teachers and we have doctors and we have surgeons and we have lawyers and we have two crown prosecutors and we have engineers and we have technical people. I, I look around the room, I've seen all these people way smarter than me and yet I see them serving in the kitchen, serving in as ushers, as greeters, uh, see them working in kids' ministry, I see them working as monitors, I see them working in the bike ministry, I see them leading small groups, I see them working in children's ministry. I, they, the list goes on and on and on. And why are these people doing this? Because there is no job that is beneath them, and the greatest of the kingdom is the servant of all. And the reason people are bored as Christians, I'll tell you why because they're spiritually unemployed. And they might have a good job doing it somewhere else, but when you are spiritually unemployed, you have this emptiness in your soul, and we are called to live for a purpose greater than ourselves. 
So the first thing is to seek, the second thing is to share, and the last and final thing is to, to share. And when I talk about sharing, I, I, it does include sharing your faith, that's an important thing. But one of the things Jesus talks about is people like us that have been so blessed in so many different ways, have so many things that God has given us, and it's incumbent upon us to share what we have with the world. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, he goes on and on about this. He said, it is more blessed to what? To give than to what? More blessed to give than to receive. He says, do not lay up treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. He tells us you cannot serve two gods, two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon. He goes on and on about this. And he tells us that our responsibility is whoever asks of us to give. And he has given us in this world so much. And he says, the Gentiles are busy seeking after these things. When you seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, something happens in your heart. It opens up a generosity in your heart where you realize God hasn't blessed me so I can just be blessed. I love what John Wesley said. He said, our goal as a Christian should be to increase our standard of giving, not our standard of living. And he says, what you need to do is get all you can, save all you can, give all you can. You know what most of us do? We get all we can, can all we get, and sit on the can. Right? <laughs> and that pretty much describe it? And so God has called us to be kingdom-minded people. How do we do that? Serving, sorry, seeking, serving, sharing. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And guess what, people? Everything else he'll take care of and make sure you have abundance in all things. That's the kingdom-minded Christian. Let's stand together. All right, we're gonna take a moment like we always do because I mentioned this, you never know when your number's gonna get called. Like the rich man, this night your soul is required. And I'm not trying to scare people, but it's just true. And the most important thing we can ever do is make that first initial decision to be a follower of Christ. And so with every head bowed, with every eye closed, if you just give me a moment here, I know there'll be people in a room this size that have never made that decision. You've never determined in your heart that you are going to be a follower of Christ. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, that you're not sure if you're on your way to heaven, if you were to die this night or this week, I want you to just slip up your hand so I can see it. Nobody's looking around. Not going to call you forward. Not going to ask you to say anything publicly. But what, are, what better t place and time than right now to make this decision? Just take a moment, let me see your hand, and then once I've seen it, you can put it down. Just take a moment here. Okay, all right. Okay, great, let's do this. We're all gonna pray together because I said I wouldn't single anybody out. Are you ready? Lord Jesus, make me a kingdom-minded Christian. Not seeking after my own, but seeking after your kingdom and your righteousness. You sent your son to the earth. He died for my sins. He rose again on the third day. And he forever lives to be my Lord. Lord, transform me today. Start the journey. Let me become kingdom focused, kingdom minded in everything I do. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout, shall we?